We would like to take another moment to thank our sponsors, whose financial support helps make Cap Times Idea Fest the important event that it is. Special thanks to our presenting sponsor, UBS, the Burrish Group. They have been a major sponsor since the very first Idea Fest. Major sponsors include HealthX Ventures, Exact Sciences, and Quartz. Co-sponsors are Madison Gas and Electric, Godfrey and Kahn Law, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and Epic. Our Friends of IdeaFest sponsors are Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, Madison Community Foundation, University Research Park, Cargo Coffee, Doc Smokehouse, and Forward Theater Company. Our media partners are the Wisconsin State Journal, Madison.com, WKOW Channel 27, and Hinkley Productions. Again, we thank you for your support and for making IdeaFest 2021 a huge success. Well, hello again, everybody. Um, if you just got here, I'm Paul Fanlin, editor and publisher of the Capital Times. And our next speaker is uh, widely regarded as the most important investigative reporter on the role of dark money in politics in America. Jane Mayer uh, was invited by our moderator for this session, David Marinus. She's written about politics, culture, and national security since the, for The New Yorker since 1995. Her recent New Yorker article headlined, The Big Money Behind the Big Lie, details how right-wing groups and foundations are leading the crusade to enact laws that limit who can vote and who can challenge the results. In it, she writes extensively about our own Bradley Foundation in Milwaukee. She is author of the 2016 New York Times bestseller titled Dark Money, The Hidden History of the Billionaires Behind the Rise of the Radical Right. The New York Review of Books pronounced it, quote, absolutely necessary reading for anyone who wants to make sense of our politics. And Esquire called Jane quite simply one of the few utterly invaluable journalists this country has. Her 2008 book was similarly impactful. It was titled, the Dark Side, the Inside Story of How the War on Terror Turned into a War on American Ideals. Uh, just a reminder, we have index cards for questions. We'll get to them as we can. Uh, the sponsor of this Idea Fest session is the Godfrey and Kahn Law Firm of Madison, represented today by Brady Williamson. We're very grateful for that support. So please welcome Jane and David to our stage. Everybody, once again, uh, this one is really a pleasure for me. Uh, Jane and I have known each other for an unbelievable amount of time, <laughs> uh, showing how old we are, or at least I am, but uh, more than 40 years going back to when Jane worked for the late, great Washington Star, and we were competing against each other uh, long, long ago. <laughs> But for the last 25 years, she's been at The New Yorker, and I consider her the premier investigative reporter uh, on money and politics in America. Um, and as Paul said, she's won a bucket full of awards and honors, and her dark money is a modern classic. Um, and for me, uh, part of my affection for Jane is her husband, uh, Bill Hamilton, who was my editor at the Washington Post for many years and the best editor I ever worked with and a wonderful guy. So uh, that deepens my relationship with them. And it, as Paul said, it's kind of a fascinating coincidence that Jane is here right after uh, writing her last piece uh, uh, for The New Yorker, which got right into money and politics and the Bradley Foundation in Milwaukee uh, with so many connections to this place. Uh, this, I don't think Jane cares about football, but I'm going to start with a Vince Lombardi saying, 
which was uh, after his second year with the Packers, um, he wanted to get to the basics. So the first meeting with the team, he held up uh, the ball and said, gentlemen, this is a football. To which Max McGee replied, coach, can you slow down? You're going too fast for us. <laughs> <laughs> so at the risk of not going too fast, Jade, could you sort of describe what exactly dark money is and its sort of origins and how it infected American life? Okay, well, listen, thank you so much. Um, I am definitely not an expert on football, but I do have to say that when I, I think, first laid eyes on David Marinus, it was playing touch football about 40 years ago. That's right. <laughs> we were, um, I think, maybe even on the same team or something in, in Washington, and I remember David because he was not only a football star, but he was a journalism star. He was just like one of the people that I always looked up to. Um, it's such a fabulous writer and reporter, and nobody really writes better about personalities and, and important issues that he brings to life. So I am thrilled to be here today with David um, and with all of you, and thank you. I've never been to Madison before, and wow, what a beautiful day to be here. So thank you. Yeah, it's really showing off for you today. <laughs> <laughs> so, But we it, tell the students, uh, well, the last student I, I brought here, a potential student, he said, well, what's it like in February? <laughs> <laughs> well, so. I've been to Duluth in February once. <laughs> that, that I remember. Um, but I, um, anyway, I th thank you. It just seems like the wrong day to talk about dark money on such a beautiful <laughs> sunny day. What is dark money? Dark money is a term that just has just generally uh, come to refer to undisclosed money flowing into American politics from people whose identities are not known. And there are tons of ways that they make it into American politics. It often, it mostly refers to money that goes through um, organizations that claim to be um, nonprofit charities of some sort or another, social welfare groups or charities. And so they're organized under the IRS to look like they're doing, um, they're supposed to be doing public interested work. And that's why they get tax deductions if they are charities. And um, they, the idea is that donors can, can give their money to whomever they want secretly. But what's happened and what I write about a lot in Dark Money is that, it, is that this kind of philanthropy has become weaponized and it's really become a huge force in American politics, but it's sort of sub rosa because it's, it's not, it doesn't acknowledge that it's actually a form of politics and lobbying and that's what it really is. So um, I spent a lot of time trying to trace the money, figure out where it was coming from, uh, turn over these rocks, sort of see, you know, the money trails and really, for me, anyway, it started a little bit in, uh, my inquiry started around the Tea Party when I started to mm. see in 2010 that there were all of these um, uh, protests and the people seemed to have the same signs and the same slogans and they were in different places all over the country and I wondered, you know, how is this organically popping up in, in every place but exactly the same? And so I started to look and what I found when you start looking is that underground there was there were sort of uh, streams of money and organizations that were connecting what looked like a spontaneous eruption of anger at the Obama administration. And what were those uh, underground uh, streams? Well sort of the first one that I came across in any big way was um, the Koch brothers and at the time nobody really knew that much who they were um, including me, but I remember actually the Times Magazine had done an interesting piece on them just as kind of uh, billionaires, but it hadn't really gotten that much into their politics, and that had been like 10 years earlier, so it was a little bit in my head. And also I'm a New Yorker mm -hmm. originally, and I remember walking around the corner at Lincoln Center, and I saw, you know, at what used to be an unnamed hall, the David Koch Theater, and I kind of thought, I wonder if people in New York have any idea when they go there who that guy is and what he's funding, because I was looking at, at, at sort of uh, financial things having to do with politics, and I was seeing David Koch's money is flowing into this, this funding the hate against Obama. And there it is right in the middle of the Upper West Side, the, one of the most liberal places in America with his name. And his name was chiseled into the side of that building, but really secret when it uh -huh. came to politics. And so, I thought it was pretty interesting and started poking around. It's amazing the way that right-wing money has uh, 
sort of invested into American culture in these insidious ways. I mean, you know, the Sackler Museum in, in Washington, you know, on the National Mall. And, I mean, I think that's yeah. sort of tradi the traditional kind of philanthropy that we know. I mean, and Freud actually wrote about how people, rich people buy art and support uh -huh. culture sometimes to sort of cleanse themselves and cleanse their reputation. And, you know, to some extent, we're all the beneficiaries of that because it's great to have great cultural organizations. And that, that is the sort of traditional kind of role for philanthropy, you know, maybe going back to the Medicis. But, but what we've seen in, in the last 40 years, especially in American politics, is that a number, not that many, but a number of just spectacularly rich very, very far-right fringe um, political ideologues have taken their fortunes and, and poured them into sort of political activism under another name, calling it philanthropy. And, 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 the, and, and among those are, since we're in Wisconsin, but uh, you know, the Koch brothers were the first I came across. The second set of brothers were the Bradleys, mm -hmm. um, you know, Lyndon and Harry Bradley. And, and they were actually sort of contemporaries, maybe even a little bit older, they were a little older than the Kochs, but they, they shared something in that they were all members of the John Birch Society, and which was considered at the time, you know, at least, to, to my way of thinking as I was growing up, I thought it was sort of over, and I thought it was really almost laughably fringe. You know, people who thought that Eisenhower, President Eisenhower was a communist, and um, it seemed so far out that I thought it had been kind of laughed off the map. But in fact, it turns out that the, these former Birch Society um, zillionaires had, were channeling their fortunes into American politics and pushing it ever, ever, ever to the right. You know, let, let's go back to the Koch brothers for a second. They're kind of the big enchiladas for this thing. And last night, um, uh, when I was talking with Phil Rucker and Carol Lennig, they talked about the moment where uh, the chief, Joint Chief of Staff Chairman uh, Milley sort of compared what he saw going on to uh, a Nuremberg moment and the, the Reichstag. Um, and sort of comparing this moment to, to the premonitions of, of Hitler. Um, and then when, when I read Dark Money, you see a literal connection between the Koch brothers, uh, their father, and the Nazis and Hitler. Tell us about that. That was such a shock to me too, I have to say. I, was, um, I can now, now explain a little bit more how I learned this. I was um, interviewing one of the unknown Koch brothers, Fred, who has such since passed on, and he was kind of the black sheep of the family. He was somewhat liberal, um, and he, he, he had told me that their father had nearly died in the Hindenburg when it was blown up, mm. um, and, um, and he was, the father Koch had been doing business in Germany, and I said to Fred, wait a minute, why was your dad in Germany during that period? And it turned out their father's fortune had been based partly first on selling refi oil refinery equipment to Stalin, and, and, and then after that, he moved on to Hitler. Um, and was, was the, the Koch brothers' fortune begins with, with these two just you know, tyrannical, monstrous figures of the last century, and, and the father was just doing business, but it, um, he actually was, he was not a Nazi, but he admired Nazi Germany enough that he brought back a nanny who was a Nazi, who, I mean, was a Nazi follower and, and supporter of Hitler's, and that <laughs> nanny raised the Koch brothers. Um, and, um, and <laughs> I remember, um, the, 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 the NPR moderator who, who um, does Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, um, is Peter Sagel? Is that, no. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, he, he, he was making fun of this thing, you know, imagining the pitch to Hollywood where you've got these evil billionaires who've got a Nazi nanny. And he said, nobody would buy it. It's too crazy. <laughs> But, uh, but were you on that show? No, no. We, oh, we, we, oh. This all unfolded oh. online. But, but, no. but at any rate, it is it is a, a, you know a, a, too wild even for a Hollywood pitch. But there there was the Nazi nanny, and she scared those little boys a lot. Um, she was incredibly strict, and um, they were kind of terrified. And I'm not a psychiatrist or psychologist, and 
I have to resist the temptation to play one as a reporter, but I am really interested in the people I cover, and I have wondered yeah. what impact that might have had on, particularly on Charles Koch, who really hated her. Um, and because he grows up to become a very radical, anti-authority libertarian. He's somebody who's been bossed around by this really mean nanny, and he grows up and he hates rules, he's thrown out of several schools, and he hates government with a passion. Um, and that, you know, and becomes sort of the, the central founder of far-right libertarianism in this country. Um, anyway, yes, they had an answer. That uh, is uh, fascinating. That's Rebelling against a Nazi nanny yeah. <laughs> turns him into a right wing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, I mean, well, you know, David, because you're such a wonderful writer about people, I, I, that you learn so, uh, they're, they're so much more interesting than just the cartoon yeah. characters people think they are. And, and I've tried to resist, you know, the sort of the, in this partisan moment, the right left thing to sort of cast all right wing people as just pure evil and left wing people as all good or whatever. You, what you find are just incredibly complex personalities. And, and I would say that's true, the Koch brothers. They were both very, very bright, the ones we know. They got um, graduate degrees from MIT as well as undergraduate ones and mostly in, in, in forms of engineering, including nuclear engineering. And, and when it came about to, to their moment to look at American politics, they wanted to take it over. They hated mm. all forms of liberalism take it over and government. Or they break wanted, it? They wanted to, well, they wanted to break the government and, and have really their vision is that, that free market should rule. Gov mm. Basically business should rule. Mm -hmm. They should rule. Um, and so, as they saw it, and so, but when they approached American politics, they did it, they looked at it as engineers, um, which I think gave them a great advantage. They mm. looked at it systemically and, and looked for where the pressure points were and the widgets were and, you know, what you could tamper with that would allow you, even if you had a tiny fringe minority view that almost the whole country rejected, how do you take over American politics? How do you affect it? They, they knew they couldn't win it in elections. They tried that in, 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 in uh, 1980. Mm. One of the Koch brothers ran on the Libertarian Party ticket as vice president and got you know, less than 1% of the vote. So they're not gonna be able to do this democratically. So what do you do? And that's what they, what they did was they created an incredible uh, blueprint for taking over American politics, their own kind of political machine. And, and, and we're living with it to this day. You know, one could say that money in itself is neutral or money is, is power and power is inevitably corrupt. Um, but the, the notion of, of these guys figuring it out as engineers, um, why wasn't there anybody on the left doing the same thing? And what, what advantages did the right have in that? In that? Well, I mean, I think at the, basically the left was complacent um, and what, what, I mean, and the, the Kochs weren't just going against the left, they were going against the, the yeah. broad consensus in America right. that government is a good thing. I mean, in the post-World War II era, there was a, you know, a, a large belief that government can do good. And, and there was the great society programs and there was great excitement in, in all the kinds of things that, that the national government was doing. And there was buy-in from most people in the country who respected people in office and respected the institutions, if you look at the polling. And what they, they wanted to, they, they, the reason that, the, that I call them radicals is they call themselves radicals. And the mm -hmm. word radical means pulling it up, by, you know, they're talking about roots. Mm -hmm. And what they talked about doing, and Charles Koch specifically, a quote from him is, is they wanted to pull the government out from the roots. They wanted to, as you say, break it, just completely um, shrink it down and, and, and remove it. And so that's, that's what, so they were going at this huge broad consensus. And why wasn't the left fighting back? There was sort of a general feeling that, you know, things were working fine and nobody was thinking about this, this threat from the far fringe coming out of Wichita, Kansas. And, and I, I think even up to when I first wrote about the Koch brothers, it was 2010 for The New Yorker. And I remember going to a party where I bumped into um, David Axelrod and um, he said, what are you working on? And I said, well, I'm writing about the Koch brothers. 
and it was the summer of 2010, hmm. and he said, who? Who are they? And it's hmm. like nobody saw it coming. And it's not that I'm a f saw it coming either. Uh, to me, it was it was a you know just an open inquiry. Who are these people? But but they were they were not even on the radar. But meanwhile, they were organizing like mad. But e even before that, it, you know, they were part of a, a, a larger uh, consortium of right wing foundations and and, and people. The, the you know the Olin Foundation. Richard Scaife was going after Clinton back in the 90s, right? For sure. With, with, uh, and, and, uh, and then you had the Bradley Foundation here. Yeah, I mean, really, it turns out, I mean, I was in, in school in the 70s, and I, I was sort of disappointed because nothing seemed to be happening. It seemed like a really boring time. Um, you know, it was like sideburns. You should have been here in the 60s. <laughs> well, that's the thing. All the older students said to me, oh, you missed it all, you know. And, and we were just right. sitting there with like Dick Cavett and, and you know, <laughs> Jimmy Carter. And, um, you know, it just wasn't that exciting, I didn't think. But when you look back what it turned out to be, if you go back and look at the history, mm. that was actually an incredibly important era for yes. the right. They were organizing um, and laying the groundwork for um, the conservative movement, and 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 so that's you've got uh, Paul Weirich in particular mm -hmm. is is coming up with these institutions, and it's the the Heritage Foundation, um, and they're turning the American Enterprise Institute into a much more right wing organization, and the Cato Institute, all these think tanks. And then, and then the moral majority and ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, gets put into place then. And then this, this, this thing called the State Policy Network, which sounds so anodyne. What is it? It's, it's tiny think tanks, it nodes in all of the states. Some of them have several of them. And they, what do they do? They come up with right-wing policy and they push it, give it to ALEC, which then creates model bills, pushes them on the state legislatures, and before you know it, you've got all this right-wing legislation rising up all around the country. So this was all, this, there was all of this going on in, this, in the beginning in the late 70s, really. Um, and, and the billionaires, there's a reason it happened then, um, because it was around, it, it was a reaction to the business world, particularly, in even beginning as early as 1971, having conniptions over the public interest movement that was rising, and particularly mm -hmm. Ralph Nader, who was challenging the Ford Motor Company and um, GM, and um, just saying, you know, there, and there was the, there was the, they were reacting to the environmental movement, which was saying that businesses were polluting. Um, they were reacting to the anti-war sentiment that was, you know, challenging defense contracts that go to a lot of these companies. Um, there, they, they, what happened was the right-wing businessmen, um, including Scaife um, and including Olin and including the Kochs um, and probably the Bradleys, uh, though they were a bit older, they were feeling threatened. By, by, by progress and change in America at that point. And they were organizing. And, and, and there's a famous memo that, that uh, Lewis Powell wrote in, in uh, 1971 that said, basically, business, you're facing an existential threat. If you don't get organized, you're going to be in, you know, you're going to lose your place in society in America. You've got to cr get organized. And they did. And that's what this, this all comes out of. And that's the Lewis Powell who became a almost progressive Supreme Court justice. Did, did he ever apologize for that statement? No, I don't think so. He was, you know, at the time he did this study for, this, for the um, uh, Chamber of Commerce, and it was a report that if you read it, looking back, it, it really does read like a blueprint for the, the rise of the right wing. And, and it's actually incredibly interesting because what he says is, is that you're, you're, the threat is not the kids in the street in Madison. It's not the anti-war protesters or the hippies. Um, he says the threat is, is um, public, just the, the establishment. They're too liberal. Mm -hmm. And he says if, what you've got to do is take over the newspapers, the courts, um, and the think tanks, and the academia, um, polite society. And science is interesting. It's on that list because we, you know, we're looking at these fights over science now. Yep. And, and I mean, I think Powell came at this 
partly not only because he was doing it for the, the uh, Chamber of Commerce, but he had been working for the tobacco companies, mm. and they were under a lot of pressure, as we know, um, because public health had finally erupted and said that, you know, what they're doing is killing people. So he, he, he anyway, this was sort of a, a, a battle cry of corporate America, and he said, you gotta get organized, and you need to take back the courts, the, acad the, the colleges, the um, pulpits. Um, all the things that we think of as right wing now were, were sort of laid out as targets. Since we're on a college campus, uh, part of that was insinuating uh, corporate money into law schools, right? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, and that has really been, I'd say, one of the... Not this law school, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, but it's one of the very most successful things that was launched during that period was the Federalist Society and the movement of um, law and economics. And, and the, 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 it was very, very much funded originally by just a handful of private foundations, family foundations, the Olin Foundation especially. Um, Bradley puts tons of money into that now. And um, it's, it's, it's really become such a force. I mean, we look at the Supreme Court today and um, how did it happen? that the justices of the Supreme Court, the majority of them are so out of step if you look issue by issue with the majority opinion in America. Well, it, it, it wasn't a total accident. There's been a long, long um, push on the far right to credential, empower, um, and, and, and place on the courts those kinds of justices and, and to push them forward. Um, I have a, a daughter at, at, at Yale Law School right now, and the Federalist Society is a really big force. Even at Yale's thought of as a very mm -hmm. um, liberal law school, but the, the Federalist Society is, it's, and, and in particular, it's known as a great thing to join if you want to get ahead, because it takes care of its own. They, they give them good jobs, they give them good clerkships, you can move your way forward towards a Supreme Court clerkship if you're really good, and then you're credentialed, you're golden. And there are certain law firms that are big law firms where they just ease right in, like absolutely Foley and Lardner, maybe. Yeah, and and <laughs> <laughs> Foley and Lardner, yeah, <laughs> that yeah. that's a, it has a special relationship with the Bradley Foundation. Yes, um, so you know you're looking at this one terrific journalist, uh, very nice, you know, if tough. Uh, incredible reporter, but, you know, you sort of became a target. You know, yeah. I've, I've never actually, I mean, the right wing went after me about Obama and Clinton, but not in the way that they went after you. What, what was that experience like? I, you know, I want you to defend yourself, but just explain what it was like when the Kochs actually hired a private investigator to try to find out things about Jane Mayer. <laughs> Well, it was so strange um, that I, I mean, I actually originally thought it was kind of like a joke um, because, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a reporter at the New Yorker magazine, which I think of, you know, when I joined it, I, I knew it's not just it's wonderful journalism, but it's great cartoons, and I thought right. there'd be a bunch of editors <laughs> with bow ties, and, and there are. I mean, it's the most civilized place on earth. And, and so we're not exactly, you know, on the barricades, and um, <laughs> and and neither am I. Um, and you know, I'm a, I'm just someone who wants to get to the bottom of things. And so, when I'm as a reporter, I feel like it's that's my sort of public duty. And so, so anyway, I had heard early rumblings. Of someone someone actually called me at some point and said, you know, there's a there's a private eye. They'd heard there was a private eye poking around me, and I, I, I really did think it was kind of funny because at the time I lived in the suburbs with my daughter and husband and dog, and I thought, oh boy, are they going to be bored? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, and um, but it turned out to actually be really awful um, mm. because what I hadn't anticipated, I mean, I knew I didn't have any big skeletons in the closet um, beyond sort of admittedly late night ice cream meeting. Um, but, but beyond that, you know, there really wasn't much, but it didn't matter. They, um, they can make it up. And mm. that's what happened. I got sort of, there was, I was very close to being um, framed as a plagiarist by the Cokes, um, who had hired a private eye 
a uh, private uh, that was run by the former commissioner of police in New York, that firm. A Giuliani um, guy, right? A, a Giuliani guy, yeah. Howard Safer. And um, it took me a long time to figure this all, put all the pieces together, but I did finally get it and, and, and write it, and they've never denied it. Um, and basically what they did was they went through 10 years of my writing, including a couple books, looking for any sentences that were the same as anybody else's sentences and using the, you know, whatever the software is that looks for plagiarism. And they came up with four examples of sentences and, um, you know, in gazillions of words. And, and they called my boss, David Remnick, um, the editor of The New Yorker, and said they were, um, this is uh, two, two right-wing publications called on the same day. The Daily Caller, which was then edited by Tucker Carlson, and, um, and um, the New York Post, and they said they, they were about to do an expose about how I was a plagiarist. And we'd heard nothing about it before that, and I had overnight to respond. And so, I, you know, I, and David called and said, you know, can you tell me what is this about? You know, can you look into this? And so it was pretty terrifying, mm. um, because if you're a reporter, any kind of writer, I mean, that's like the, the crime that's gonna kill you. Mm -hmm. um, it will just do in your career. And, and, and so it was like a bullet coming right at my head. And so I called, I got, I called Tucker Carlson, who I knew. I said, Tucker, you know I'm not a plagiarist. And he said, I don't know any such thing. And, <laughs> and I said, all right, send me the exam. What are, what, are you, what are the goods? What are the examples here? So he sends me these four sentences. And so I thought, okay, I'll do oppo, you know, I'll do um, crisis management. So I, um, just like they do in politics, and I, I, I called up the authors of these stories and said, you know, if you feel I plagiarized, I'm incredibly sorry, but if you don't, would you please put out a statement saying this is bull? And um, to all four of them backed me up, and they went on the record. And <laughs> yes. Thanks, and, 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 and that applause should be for them because really the lesson is like if someone is being falsely framed, help them out if you can because it's a hideous experience and it could have been career ending and instead they were brave enough to just tell the truth and they all went on the record and I got statements and I sent it to Tucker in the morning and said, Tucker, here's what they say and if you publish it, you know that it's false and it's malicious, which is a textbook definition of libel. Mm -hmm. And I took my dog for a walk and I came back and there was a little note from Tucker Carlson saying we're not running it. And, um, and then the New York Post also backed off it. And to their credit, they did a story saying smear disappears. And who was behind it? And they started reporting and they started raising questions about whether the Cokes were part of it. And it, 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 it took a while, but eventually it led right back to their doorstep. So, so that's what they do. When you know when they want to really bring you down, yeah. they fight. They fight dirty, and um, and it wasn't just at me. They've they've gone after many many of their critics in the environmental world, um, people who worked for them who wanted to blow the whistle, um, people who brought suits against them for their pollution. I mean they've they 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 fought very very hard and and very ugly against a lot of people over time. And, and uh, one small reporter is just a little piece of it. Um, and it's, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's what you've got to do if you want this country to, to be able to understand what's going on. It's just the price of doing business. You've mm -hmm. got to like tell the truth even if, and it wasn't, it turned out, you know, I'm very lucky. I work at a great, great publication with great lawyers. They'd never lost faith in me and they've always backed me up. So, so you know, they look carefully to make sure you got it right. But if you have it right, they're going to publish it. So um, I didn't know that story. That's that's very illuminating and scary. But and it's sort of scary that they knew exactly what this what the bullet was. Yeah, know? it is, isn't it? Yeah, you know, like yeah. that would be the thing. Yeah. That, I mean, I did hear I, later. I heard that they had looked elsewhere for bad stuff. They had gone actually were looking into a former boyfriend of mine. And I thought that is really scraping the bottom of the right. barrel. <laughs> you know, so I'd been married for years by then. Yeah. So I'm glad okay. they were so desperate. <laughs> well, um, earlier today, I was speaking with Juliet Eilperin and, and Bonnie Jo Mount about climate change. And uh, 
you know, its devastating effects around the globe. And, and the Cokes have uh, deep tentacles in fossil fuels, and I'm sure that that's uh, attacking climate activism is, is one of their uh, main priorities. How, how did you see that play out? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, their fortune, I mean, and their fortune is gigantic. Um, I mean, one of them, uh, David has now died, so we're really talking about Charles, but um, they were both made about, typically they, when I last was looking, it was a couple years ago, they were each making a billion dollars a year. And, um, and they were, you know, often listed as five and six of the, the wealthiest people in America and wealthiest people in the world. So we're talking about a gigantic fortune that came from fossil fuels, primarily. Um, and it's pipelines, it's refineries, um, and uh, they own a lot of the tar sands fields up in, in, in Canada that, that you know, they've made a huge investment. So, they, so anything that gets between America, America's economy and fossil fuels threatens their bottom line. And, you, and, and, um, and so they, that's a lot of the reason that they got so organized in the last, I'd say, 10, 15 years um, in putting out disinformation about climate change. And they've, they, there's a Greenpeace report that identifies them as, quote unquote, the kingpins of climate denial. And they, they really were, it was a very, sub rosa kind of thing they were doing, but they were funding all these organizations that first denied that fossil fuels were causing climate change, um, and, and secondly, I mean, they went through all these iterations. At one point, they decided, they finally had acknowledged climate change is real, but they then came out saying it was gonna be great um, because there'll be more arable land in the world for, you know, because everything's going to melt and you can plant up in the North Pole or whatever. Um, I, I interviewed somebody who worked at one of their think tanks at the Cato Institute who literally said to me, the polar bears have never had it better. Um, and I'm sitting there thinking, you know, how He's interviewed can, many of them, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, how can, you, how can you even say that? But, you know, of course they had some study that they had funded and some scientist who was willing to take the money and say so, and they hand it to you. And, you know, and um, it's had a... I, I do think that they in particular had just an extraordinary impact in American policy. I mean, there's really no other sort of modern country that has gone the opposite direction from doing something about climate change other than the American mm. Congress. The only reason the American Congress won't do anything about climate change, unlike every other you know, modern country, is because it's in the pocket of these interests. And it's so incredible to watch it play out in Washington. You know, and they, and they, 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 they're still, you know, basically paralyzed, that is Congress is, by the money that they take in and by organizations like the American Petroleum Institute. And they've confused a lot of people in this country about what, what you know, whether the science is real. And, and, and it, I, you know, I think it's a tragedy. And I, but I, I think it, I also am very hopeful that the reality is becoming impossible to ignore. And, that, and, that, and you could look at public polls and you can see that all over this country now, in almost every county, the New York Times had a, a chart that showed people believe that climate change is real mm -hmm. and that we have to do something about it. So the oil companies are beginning to lose the battle of public opinion. This is kind of a esoteric question, like the difference between uh, Stalinists and Trotskyists, but, but the Koch brothers, <laughs> Uh, didn't like Trump, right? I right. mean, basically, even though they both believe in pulling something up by the roots, I don't know what Trump believes in anything, but <laughs> what was it about him that they didn't? It was really interesting, isn't it? Um, and so, um, yeah, Charles Koch said in 2016 that the, the choice between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump was like choosing between cancer and a heart attack. So he, he wasn't on board with either. And it was, you know, the thing is, by 2016, the Cokes were poised with this gigantic jackpot that they were going to pour into the, whoever the Republican nominee was. It was Scott like, Walker, maybe, huh? Yeah, they, oh, they loved Scott Walker. But they had, I, if I remember correctly, um, I think it was $889 million ready to go. 
um, through their various political <clears throat> um, memberships and, and groups. And, and so they, they, they were dashed because um, the one candidate on the Republican side that they really didn't like, Trump, got the nomination and they were sort of stuck. Um, and so why, don't they, why didn't they like Trump? Well, if you think about um, the Kochs as far-right libertarians, the thing they hate most is, is big government. Um, they hate regulations, they hate taxes, they hate social programs, they want to get rid of basically every, every department of government. And so that's not who Trump is. Trump's, Trump's a sort of an authoritarian, um, you know, uh, power-hungry, um, you know, old-style Mussolini-type ruler mm -hmm. who likes all the trappings of, you know, big government, and and so he he's not he was not ideologically aligned with them, and in fact he kind of made fun of them a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, he portrayed himself as um, someone who. Um, was not corrupt because he was so rich. He said he didn't need the money of people like the Kochs, and um, and you know so so I think some of some of tr some of the Trump supporters saw him as someone who was going to drain the swamp, as they as he put it, and really clean up Washington. Of course, that was a big lie, but 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 that is how he sold himself, and and he put pitted himself against. These big, big donors like the like the Cokes, which was, of course, you know, insulting to them. So that that enmity didn't last all that long. However, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, they made peace, and one of the biggest peace offerings was the choice of vice president. Mike Pence was the person that Charles Koch really wanted to see become president in 2012. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he is someone who the Kochs had put a ton of an investment into um, grooming and helping get ahead. And uh, so, and, and so picking, picking Pence was really an olive branch to um, the Kochs and others, the, you know, the Christian right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then pretty much an awful lot of the people who started to run the, the policy areas that are important to the Kochs during the Trump years, were very much in line with the Koch's interests. So we had, you know, at the Secretary of Interior right. and all, anybody who was dealing with fossil fuels and the environment was their person. Mm -hmm. And Trump was Trump, pretty much, you know, gave them what they wanted. And it wasn't too long after I think maybe it was a year or two into the Trump administration when the head of Americans for Prosperity, which is the biggest of the Koch's political groups, um, said outright, there's almost no daylight between us, meaning mm. the Kochs, mm. and Trump. Trump. Mm. So it ended, depending on your point of view, happily ever after, <laughs> or, <laughs> or, or terribly. Where we thought it might. Um, okay, let's, let's get to your latest piece in the New Yorker, which is everybody uh, who, subscribes to The New Yorker in Madison and Wisconsin, Great. just ate up. Um, although it doesn't start there. The big money behind the big lie is the name of it. And it starts in a church in Phoenix with the most bizarre scene uh, you can imagine. You know, it tests your credulity uh, about the world we live in and the, the Republican Party now lives in. Uh, you know, with this bogus documentary, uh, the big rig and the founder of Overstock.com. Describe that scene for us. Well, it's what just it? that, the, you know, it, it was the most clownish situation, the people running that audit out in Arizona. And, and I, I, I was just hearing um, um, the senator before me here s describing the effort in, in Wisconsin similarly as a folly. You know, these people look like they're just total clowns. And, um, and so in the case in Arizona, one of the people who was sort of big on pushing for the audit um, was a, 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 a QAnon follower who calls himself Baby Q and says that he's getting messages from his future self back to him, telling him what to do. So, I mean, these people don't seem like they have both feet on the ground, let alone um, understanding politics. but. But at any rate, they kind of ran away with the show. And I, I, um, I went out there kind of thinking it was something of a joke. 
and you know wasn't sure I, I just wanted to find out more about it and and basically I came away thinking it's actually not so funny it's it, mm -hmm. and and I interviewed a lot of the people who were um, dealing with it in Arizona and the truth is when you step back even though the characters who were running it seem incredibly flaky um, it is an American presidential election that is still being contested now um, and that what message does that send to Americans? It suggests that you can't rely on our democracy, that elections are rigged, they're not, you know, that they, they may be corrupt. Um, and it, it just brings in a level of distrust about democracy that is absolutely toxic. And it also sets, the, it's not just look backwards looking. What, what people I interviewed explained, and I think they were, you know, these were very good points that people made was, it's not just about what happened in 2020. Mm -hmm. It's laying the groundwork mm -hmm. for 2022 and 2024. If you can say that, that the state of Arizona's election was in some way stolen, then it becomes an excuse for cracking down on election laws all over the country. It's replicated elsewhere. So you see these other audits popping up in other states, in Wisconsin, uh, uh, Pennsylvania. And all of them become excuses for legislatures to basically make it harder for people to vote, to, um, to put in very partisan figures overseeing the elections, and, and to sort of lay the groundwork for making it easier for their side to win in 2022 and 2024. And, and um, you know, it's kind of a dangerous game, really. Is this the new normal? Do you think that the Republican Party will be challenging every election from now on? I mean, I they obviously they tried to do it in California, but it was such a blowout that Elder it, couldn't do it. But. I mean, it was what, what the, they, Larry Elder was talking about doing until he was blown totally yeah. out of the water. Yeah. I mean, I saw Karl Rove, the, you know, Republican, um, um, you know, uh, political consultant, whatever, um, it, it, saying, he thought it was a really um, self-destructive thing for the Republican Party to do, so it, I, I want, which made me wonder if maybe they're seeing that suddenly this isn't working very well, because what it does is it it um, it just it basically makes Republican voters feel like it's not worth voting. If you tell everybody that it's rigged. Mm and they're not gonna win, they stay home, which is sort of what happened in the runoff in Georgia. Mm -hmm. um, and so Carl, so when you've lost Karl Rove, I wonder if you're sort of beginning to see maybe a push back against this thing. But it is very much what, what Trump is doing. And, and, and as we've seen, Trump has very much taken over the Republican Party right now, apparatus. And what I was writing about, since it's about the big money behind the big lie, is that what fascinated me was so much of the Republican establishment that you think of as not part of necessarily Trump's, you know, delusions right. has gone in on it now. And so that you see big, powerful, and sort of um, prestigious organizations putting money into spreading the idea that American elections are rife with fraud and that they can't be relied on. And that is a lie. Uh, it's just absolutely not true. American elections are very secure, um, and the amount of fraud that takes place is minute. And uh, you can, it's almost impossible to find an example where, in, in recent times, where it's had any effect on the outcome of a major, any major election. Maybe in the most local, local races, you can do something, but certainly not in a presidential election. Not, and, and, and yet, you see big organizations now pushing that idea. And including the Bradley Foundation. The Bradley Foundation. Tell and us about their connection to this. So that, that's what, to me, was some, one of the most surprising things. I go out to Arizona to look at the clown show and come back looking to try to figure out who's funding this idea that these elections have been rigged. And it, I, you start looking at the funding on, I look up f federal filings of, of um, sort of charitable organizations. And there's the Bradley Foundation, which if you go back to 2012, by my count, and Bradley Foundation has disputed my counting, but I stand by it, 
If you go back to 2012, you can see that they have put $18 million into 11 different organizations that, are, that have been involved in pushing the idea that there's voter fraud is a huge problem in this country. And so they've gone all in on this thing. And they actually have been very important in terms of, I think, you know, spreading, spreading this myth, this falsehood. And, um, you know, I, why are they doing it? I, th I think there are, there are a lot of political benefits for the far right doing this because it, it means that they'll, they'll crack down on, on, they'll make voting harder, um, they may uh, dissuade um, they try to make it harder for students and universities to vote, for instance. Um, people of color, uh, people who live in hard to, who work during the day, all these things that, that make it harder for people to vote, they're, they're, they're helping further by doing this. And then another connection to a Milwaukee law firm, uh, Foley and Lardner, is Cleta Mitchell, who was inside the White House sort of... Uh, dealing with Trump on this. And yeah, that was, a, that was interesting. So Cleta Mitchell was, until recently, a partner at the Milwaukee law firm Foley and Lardner. She's also still a director of the Bradley Foundation, mm -hmm. and she is chairman of a group called the Public Interest Legal Foundation, which is one of the most sort of virulent anti-voter um, anti groups. Uh, they would call themselves a, a, an election integrity group. They, they, um, that organization that she's part of, another director there is one of the speakers in the January 6th rally that tried to say that, that um, Biden shouldn't be, have, um, have the, the vote certified. Um, you know, so these are, it's a pretty radical group of people. And um, there she is right on the board of the Bradley Foundation. Um, it's, it, it, and I interviewed her for the piece and I think one of the things I'd like to say as a reporter here is I think it's really important whenever possible to try to talk to the people on the other side and understand, if you want to understand what's going on in this country, uh, you know, it's not, I mean, I'm at a fairly liberal publication, but I want to know what, what are the Kochs thinking? What is Cleta Mitchell thinking? What are the people at the Bradley Foundation thinking? What is their rationale for all of this? And you can read it in that piece, because I, I spoke extensively to Cleta Mitchell in it. And um, you know, I, I hope that it, it gave her um, a chance to say what she thinks and to, to treat it her fairly. Um, I, I think that she's wrong. I don't see voter fraud. Um, I think that, that no experts have really backed up what she's saying, but she, she really believes that American elections are just um, rife with fraud. It's, uh, it's Orwellian, the, the way that they can use the word election fraud, you know, in, in this context of trying to quelch democracy at the same time. Well, I, you know, I know. <laughs> yeah, you're right. And I think, I mean, I think a, a number of the people I interviewed suggest that what is this really about? It's, it's you know, how can it be that today, uh, I think just this last week, there's a poll that shows that 78% of Republican, Republicans who were polled think that Trump won the last election and that Biden didn't win. Now, how can that be this many months after an election that Biden clearly won? And, and I think what you're looking at are people who don't really believe that, um, that people, unlike themselves, have a total right to vote. And there's a, there's a quote in that story that points out that, um, that Trump is actually, he won the white vote. He won the white rural vote. Mm -hmm. He is in some ways the elected president of white America. And for people who think that's what America is, he is their president. And that what, what it, it denies, though, is that all the other people who don't look like them are legitimate voters. And I think that's kind of what it, it's, this is uh, playing out an idea that, that, that he is kind of the president of a nation within the nation. And, and I think that's what's scary to me about this whole movement is that there are people who really think that people who don't look like them are not fully American and don't really have a right to vote. And that's what I worry about. 
I think George Packer and Charlie Sykes will get into some of that stuff about the America within America stuff and Wisconsin within Wisconsin later yeah. today. Yeah, I mean, and, yeah. and I think we may be seeing more of it in the next few years for the simple reason that we all know we're, the, we're at a point where the population is changing and we're getting, you know, at least if the projections are right, towards a point where the white, white people in America are no longer the clear majority. And, and I think a lot of people find that quite scary and I, you know, and I get that from talking to, for instance, there's a person in that story about the big, the big money behind the big lie. One of the, the heroes of the story is actually a Republican official in Maricopa County. Mm -hmm. He's on the board of supervisors. He's quite conservative, but he, he also believes in facts. And he says, there is no doubt <laughs> Biden won in Arizona, and and that they did an they had an honest and accurate election there, and he has stood up for this. But what he says is he feels his own party is um, a lot of people in his own party. He says are frightened by the idea that um, of diversity, a diverse electorate, and he thinks that Obama was the beginning of that. Mm -hmm. That this is a lot of yeah, this is a reaction that. against Obama from his standpoint. And that's pretty, you know, while, mm -hmm. while you hear liberals, liberal Democrats saying that, it's very interesting to hear it from an elected official who's Republican mm -hmm. in Arizona. Mm -hmm. and, and he says it outright in that piece, and he thinks that's a lot of what's motivating this. We could talk for three hours. Uh, we've got tons of questions from the audience here, but um, I'll try to get to a couple of them. <laughs> but first, you also wrote an amazing piece about Mitch McConnell oh, uh, earlier. And, uh, you know, I was struck the other day watching uh, Amy Comey Barrett speaking at the, you know, McConnell Center in Kentucky, um, you know, where he had greased the wheels for her entire nomination and all of that. And then she's saying that the Supreme Court is above partisanship. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you ever think they protest too much, as I say? Right. Um, but, but anyway, in your piece, it was before January 6th, and it was McConnell as the enabler-in-chief. And obviously, there was some friction after that. But how do you see the relationship between McConnell and Trump now? Well, it's very complicated and interesting, I think. I mean, McConnell um, is about one thing, which is um, getting and holding power for himself and his party. Um, and, and so... He knows that Trump's got the whole... And Trump's just about getting power for himself. For himself, yeah, sure. right? And, sure. but, you know, I mean, it's not, that, it's not that McConnell's not about himself, right. but he wants to keep the majority in the Senate. And I think he sees... I mean, he was very mad at, at Trump for losing... He blames him for losing the Georgia Senate seat, both of them. Um, and, mm -hmm. and, and that dumped him out of power as majority leader. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so he thinks... He, he thinks Trump is not a good operator. Um, he's not, not as good as McConnell is, and McConnell's very far-sighted, and he wants to see his party in power, and he sees Trump as, as pushing candidates who may not win and um, getting in his way. He wants to get back into being majority mm -hmm. leader. Uh, I, I wanted to say that um, when, when you were talking last night to Phil Rucker and Carol Leonard, um, they were saying, you were asking something about, you know, the, the souls of the people who have backed Trump. You know, how do they see it in their own soul? How do they justify it? And they, and they were laughing and saying, well, we don't ask them about their souls. But I actually did ask, I, I, one of the most astounding quotes to me in that story about McConnell comes from someone who knows him really, really well. Mm -hmm. And I was asking this person, what what does he care about? Like, what really makes him tick? And this person who truly knows him said, if you're looking for him to have a soul or mm. to really care about something, the person said, he doesn't. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have one and he doesn't. And this, you know, and I had been looking for months trying to understand him, like, what is mm -hmm. there? And they said, nothing. It's just like the hollow man who wants power. And, and I think that's what you kind of have to understand with McConnell. Um, and mm -hmm. he's very good at getting power and mm -hmm. holding power, but, mm -hmm. but um, there's not a lot of depth to that soul. 
So the, the two questions I'm going to ask, both people get a copy of Jane's wonderful book, Dark Money. I don't, <laughs> they're, they're, not, they're, they're not signed, but whoever asked it will know that they're the one who asked it. And this relates back to, to Barrett and, and McConnell in a sense. Um, it's not the sort of question that you normally ask, but should the Biden administration seriously consider expanding the Supreme Court? So, so I always consider myself, um, and David will recognize this, a reporter, not a pundit, right. and it's a line that sort of nobody believes in anymore, <laughs> but I really do. So I try not to advocate my, you know, whatever my personal views are, I, I, you know, I'm not even sure what my views would be if I were waterboarded on that question. But, um, <laughs> but so I, I, I don't know. I mean, I do think the problem of the Supreme Court is really a, a, a serious one. I think it's very out of step with this country on many, many issues at this point. For me, the, the way I look at it is, is I wanna know more um, not about expanding the court necessarily. I want to know more about the dark money that helped put those justices mm -hmm. on that court. And there is a whole system, there's a, there are a bunch of organizations that have worked very hard and mostly in the dark to put those justices on the court. There's been, there are secret funders who've spent a lot of money on behalf of getting those justices confirmed. There's one, there's one funder, one donor in particular, whose identity none of us who follow this stuff know. We know there's one person who has spent $18 million on behalf of getting um, some of those justices confirmed. I'd like to know who that is, because that's a pretty big investment on building that court. So that's where my, mm -hmm. my, <laughs> so that's a great my interests answer. go. Yeah, that, that. And the, the other question relates to dark money, and is an interesting one that I hadn't considered, but. What role can the IRS play uh, in fighting dark money? In other words, if they're using it through charitable organizations, is there anything that can I be done I think the there? IRS could play a great role if it had the, the, um, um, the guts and also the, the you know, wh wherewithal. I mean, part of it, the, 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 literally the IRS has been um, really cut down to a tiny size, the part that deals with charitable um, organizations. And it's been very deliberately, um, you know, decimated by um, conservatives on, in Congress um, who've pretty much tied its hands. But if you could give, give it that power, which it does have in, by law, it could really bring down the hammer on some of these groups because nobody is, no group is supposed to get charitable status that is involved in electoral po partisan electoral politics. They, it's, you, you, you can't, they have to swear to the government that they're not involved in politics in order to get that tax exempt status. And it's of course a joke when you look at what these groups are doing. And I, I would love to see a good suit um, brought by somebody over it. Great. Um, and finally, you know, Jane, you, you, you write about these difficult subjects that you have to penetrate deep into worlds that don't want you in there. And you come out with some, some pretty uh, dark stuff about dark stuff. Um, <laughs> how, how does, you know, how, does, how has that affected your outlook on, on the world that your daughter's gonna inherit? Well, you know, the, I mean, the thing is, I feel like I'm doing some good. I may be deluded in that, but, but, but the idea that motivates me is if I tell this country what's going on and give readers facts that if something's wrong, they can fix it. So I feel like I'm part of a process of, of reform and renewal, I hope. And so it, people think it's gonna be, I'm, I'm, that I'm some deep pessimist. I'm actually not. I really mm. feel like um, this is all part of how democracy is supposed to work and I love that we have a free press and you can tell the truth about people in power. Um, so, um, you know, so I felt pretty good about that. I, I do worry for my daughter, though, about the climate, and I worry about democracy right now. Uh, it's, been, it's been scary to be in Washington during the Trump years, um, because you kind of think that there's going to be a, a guardrails to democracy that you can't, that will keep it from going too far. 
and I think what we learned was those guardrails are pretty weak. Um, they're still standing. The courts have been good um, for the most part. Um, I think civil society has been really good. I think the press has been really good. I think you know there are all kinds of robust pushback, um, but but it's been exhausting, and I worry what happens if we get part two. Well, I think everyone in this audience will agree that you're doing what you're doing is good. So thank, well, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We would like to take another moment to thank our sponsors, whose financial support helps make Cap Times Idea Fest the important event that it is. Special thanks to our presenting sponsor, UBS, the Burrish Group. They have been a major sponsor since the very first Idea Fest. Major sponsors include Health X Ventures, Exact Sciences, and Quartz. Co-sponsors are Madison Gas and Electric, Godfrey and Kahn Law, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and Epic. Our Friends of IdeaFest sponsors are Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, Madison Community Foundation, University Research Park, Cargo Coffee, Doc Smokehouse, and Forward Theater Company. Our media partners are the Wisconsin State Journal, Madison.com, WKOW Channel 27, and Hinkley Productions. Again, we thank you for your support and for making IdeaFest 2021 a huge success. <laughs>